Well, how about we uh, go to our Village Inn hotline, where all of our guests always appear, and this man really needs no introduction. He is a longtime friend of the show. Matter of fact, he's been to El Paso so many times uh, years ago. He once looked at uh, real estate because he was thinking of living here during the winter. And said he went to your wedding, Steve. He was uh, definitely uh, at the wedding. And uh, it was one of the highlights for for Karen and I when we Mm -hmm. had the opportunity to tie the knot and have uh, Harold and uh, Eileen Letterman as our guests. And he joins us live on our Village Inn hotline. Uh, HBO's uh, ringside judge. Great to have you back on in El Paso, Harold. And uh, boy, if you're a boxing fan, I think uh, Canelo Alvarez uh, made you a big believer uh, Saturday night. Oh, my goodness. You know, Steve, you really got to... You really got to go back a few years. Maybe you got to go back some of those 40 years to think when you saw uh, such a vicious knockout. You know, I mean, that was incredible. I mean, the guy was out cold by one punch. I mean, you know, I mean, the James Kirkland knockout was pretty scary. But I'm telling you, he got Amir Khan out of there with one right hand. It was brutal. I mean, Amir Khan was laying there like he was dead. I mean, you know, it's the only way you can describe it. It just came out of nowhere. But, you know, the thing about, about Gennady Golovkin, everybody's talking Gennady Golovkin. Uh, the question is, is Canelo Alvarez a bit scared of him? I mean, that that's the $64 question. I mean, you know, uh, for example, let, let's say, you know, we, we said uh, tonight that we heard that Danny Jacobs, uh, uh, you know, that Canelo Alvarez, that uh, Gennady Golovkin wants to fight Danny Jacobs, you know? Well, Gennady Golovkin would be anxious. Danny Jacobs wouldn't be anxious. Well, the question here is, is Canelo Alvarez as anxious to fight Gennady as Gennady is to fight him? I mean, Gennady would sign a contract today, you know, regardless of the terms. He would just sign a contract. He's that anxious to fight Canelo Alvarez. The question is, is Canelo really serious about fighting Gennady? You know, I guess enough people said to uh, Canelo, you know, well, when are you going to fight Triple G? You know, everybody wants to see uh, Canelo with Triple G. I mean, you know, we, we sort of all knew that, that Canelo was going to get by at Vietcon. We didn't realize it was going to be so sensational. But, you know, um, you, you got to wonder if uh, he's got a little bit of doubt in his mind. I, I would be very, very happy if he'd say, well, look, I didn't work too hard Saturday night. We need a couple of months to promote the fight, but I think we should do it in August, you know, something like that. You know, before the uh, the World Series starts, you don't have to worry about that nonsense. You know, like Saturday night, they had to worry about how many people were going to watch the fight and how many people were going to watch basketball. You know, it was a huge basketball night Saturday night. So, you know, um, you know, if uh, Canelo does sign the contract, I'm sure we could get that fight pretty well promoted, you know, get a location. You were talking before about Cowboy Stadium. Uh, you know, get a location and get it off the ground and sell some pay-per-view homes. Certainly, you know, by August or by September. I mean, you know, I guess the baseball playoffs don't start till around October, so you don't have to worry about that interference. And, you know, there's nothing stopping the fight from happening, and it would be a great fight. What makes it such a great fight is that Gennady Golovkin takes a great punch. I mean, not only is the guy a brutal puncher, but he takes a great punch. You hit him on the jaw, he don't flinch. And, uh, you know, that's what you need to beat Canelo. You need a guy with sensational movement like Floyd Mayweather, or you need a guy with a good draw like Gennady Golovkin. Those are the two, two things that will, you know, possibly beat Canelo Alvarez because Canelo, at 25 years old, is a star. It seemed like at the start of the fight, Amir Khan had the right game plan. Now, how did you well, have the fight? How did you have the fight yeah. scored up until the knockout? What was your What was your scorecard after five rounds? Oh, I had a 3-2 to two Canelo. I mean, you know, for two rounds, there's no question, Amir Khan boxed beautifully. What killed Amir Khan, let me tell you, I went to the weigh-in, and it was, a, it was a weigh-in that was, you know, where you could clearly get some idea of what the heck was going to happen because Amir Khan looked soft. I mean, I never figured that Amir Khan was going to come in at 155. The guy is a true welterweight, always weighed around 147, you know, which is the welterweight limit. I figured, well, he'll come in at 149, 150, 151, which will give him a little bit more power and certainly a lot of speed. But he came in looking pudgy. I mean, he, he had a stomach. I mean, you could see that he was soft. I mean, you know, you could just clearly see it at the weigh-in. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't seem bothered by that 155 pounds that he weighed. On the other hand, Canelo always weighs 155 and looks solid as the, as the rock as your brother at the weigh-in. And that's the way it played out. For two rounds, Amir Khan was moving really nice. 
not throwing anything that would have hurt Canelo. That's for darn sure. I mean, you know, he didn't have enough power to do any damage to Canelo, but you know, certainly he threw enough jabs, he had enough movement, and he did well. But in the third round, Canelo started to walk him down and go to the body, and, and you know, that, that seemed to be the downfall of Amir Khan. He walked him down, went to the body, went to the body again in round four, stayed in the body in round five. I mean, you know, he was certainly landing up. Canelo was landing a lot of punches in rounds three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. Amir Khan really wasn't doing the damage that he did in rounds one and two. And then in the sixth round, all of a sudden, bam, you know, he, he got him with the big right hand. We're talking right now with Harold well, Letterman. Gennady was sitting right next to me, you know. <laughs> he, he was in the first row. He, you know, he had a real good view of what happened, but didn't seem to bother him one bit. Well, and that's he, the he thing. He was in the ring, too. Yeah, afterwards. He, afterwards, it was like, it's like it turned yeah. into a professional wrestling match. Yeah. I mean, you got Canelo Alvarez calling out Triple G. He's right there. It was great. It was almost like watching uh, Hogan and Andre and stare down <laughs> from WrestleMania three. Uh, Harold. It was fun. But it, it's the first time we've ever, ever heard Canelo Alvarez call out Gennady Golovkin. Nobody calls out <laughs> Gennady Golovkin. Everybody's scared of Gennady Golovkin. So they got 30 days. Canelo Alvarez is the champion. He's got 30 days to negotiate a fight with with uh, Gennady Golovkin. Otherwise, it goes to the first bid. Those are the, you know, that's the WBC rules. Mm -hmm. If Canelo Alvarez doesn't defend the title against uh, Gennady Golovkin, who's the mandatory challenger, he's got to give up the title, you know? And it doesn't look like Mauricio Suleiman, who comes from Mexico, is going to bend the rules for Canelo Alvarez, who's, you know, the big hero of Guadalajara. But, you know, it's, if I was going to take a bit of a, a bit of promoting, for example, my daughter Julie uh, was in Florida, and uh, she and her boyfriend, Max DeLuca, a well-known boxing judge from California, went to see the fight in a movie theater in Fort Lauderdale. And Julie says to me, Dad, she says there were about five people in the movie theater which just goes to show that Canelo really doesn't have widespread universal popularity. I mean, you know, he's starting to get a name for himself. Saturday night he helped himself a ton. But, you know, he's not exactly Willie Mays. He's not exactly Hank Aaron. He's not exactly Kevin Durant. And he's certainly not Steph Curry. You know, I mean, the, uh, the, the Canelo Alvarez name is known, but it ain't that well known. You know, it's known among the boxing fans in El Paso. The millions of boxing fans in El Paso. But, you know, it's it's not known all over the place, and that's for sure. As they say, Julie was shocked that the theater was so empty in Fort Lauderdale. Because, you know, Mia Khan and Canelo, two decent names in boxing, and they didn't draw a crowd. And, you know, this fight, in order to pay these two guys, you're going to have to bring in a lot of money. That means you're going to have to probably do, you know, around a million pay-per-view homes minimum to make money on this fight. So... You know, it's going to take some promoting. There's no doubt about it. It's a great fight. We know that. The fight fans want to see that, see it. You know, uh, we know it's going to be a great fight for the fight fans, but the question is, is, is uh, they're going to do enough pay-per-view homes uh, to make any money? Now, certainly, I believe in Dallas, you know, with the Latino population, uh, it should do very, very well at Cowboy Stadium. There's no doubt about that. I think that they're, they're going to be in a running to, to host this fight. And, uh, you know, that, that new T-Mobile arena that they used on Saturday night probably holds about 20000 for boxing. It's a huge arena. No question. You know, it's a very nice arena, good sidelines from anywhere. Um, I found that the food left a little, little bit to be desired. Everybody was complaining. Mm -hmm. They went to the HBO pre-fight party. It was just, you know, they ran out of food. You know, stuff that shouldn't happen, but in a new arena it does happen, you know. Uh, clock the traffic, you know, getting in and out of the arena was pretty bad on Saturday night as well. And, uh, you know, these are things that the lion out as time goes by. Uh, Harold, you talk about uh, possibly him becoming a mainstream star, talk about Canelo, all of this. Do you think the fact that he really doesn't speak any English, do you think that hurts him? Absolutely. There is no question. You know, you, you got to learn a language. Gennady's learning the language real well. I'll tell you what Gennady is right now. Gennady's living in Los Angeles, you know. Well, you know, he doesn't want to go back to Kazakhstan. It's too cold there. He loves living in Los Angeles. You know, he trains up in Big Bear in California. And it was, what does uh, Abel Sanchez call his gym, the Summit Boxing Club or whatever? Anyway, Gennady told me, he says, you know, Gennady, when you talk to him, if you talk slow and you don't use any crazy words, like Max Kellerman tends to use those big words that he learned at Columbia University, you know? But if you don't use any big words and you talk to him slow, he understands you perfectly. So, for example, 
I said to him on Saturday night, I said, how do you like living in Los Angeles? You know, he smiled. He said, I love it there. I said, how do you like the schools? He says, do the kids like the schools? You know, as I say, I said all of that very slowly. He said, the kids love the schools. He says, I'm really, you know, very, very, very happy in Los Angeles, you know, between the training there and the living there. He says he's extremely happy about being in L.A. And, you know, he's learning the language really well. He does... uh, he does interviews in English, you know, pre-fight press conferences in English, press conferences like, you know, ESPN had all the heavy hitters there Saturday night. So they didn't have Steve Kaplowitz, but they had Teddy Atlas and Dan <laughs> Raphael there <laughs> and Brian Campbell, all the heavy hitters. Anyway, uh, when they do interviews with Gennady, he, you know, he speaks to women in English. So his English is really well, you know. Canelo, on the other hand, seems to understand English. You talk to him, and you don't, have, you don't need an interpreter to, you know, to give him the question, but he doesn't. He doesn't answer you in English. He answers you in Spanish all the time, 100 percent of the time. So you need an interpreter alongside of him. I guarantee it's hurting him. His popularity will go up immensely once his English gets a little bit better. You wonder if he'll uh, take classes or do something to well, try to improve. Go, go, the Golden Boy guy should know that. You know, look, look. Let's face reality. Who owns Golden Boy? Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar knows that the the problems of the Spanish community. I mean, he's there. You know, Oscar's been the head of Golden Boy since day one since he founded the company. Yeah. I mean, if anybody would understand the problem, Oscar should, should understand it. And certainly, Oscar should, you know, get him the best English teacher available. Uh, I heard stories that, you, you, you know the uh, you know the name Gilberto Ramirez, that super middleweight that Bob Aram is promoting from Mexico, mm-hmm. uh, undefeated kid that just beat Arthur Abraham on an HBO pay-per-view show. I understand that Gilberto Ramirez is picking up English like a shot. I mean, they say he speaks English almost as well as he speaks Spanish these days, and this is a kid that has lived solely in Mexico, you know? So there are some guys that learn it a little quicker and some guys that learn it a little bit slower. But there's no doubt about it that Oscar De La Hoya should get the best English teacher he can get for Canelo Alvarez. It would help him immensely. You know, it helped Julio Cesar Chavez during his career. And Canelo's got to take that same attitude, you know, by learning English. It really would help his career. I'll tell you something else that's hurt. The fact that you can't talk to Chepo Rosario and uh, and his son Eddie Rosario, the two terrific trainers that have got uh, Canelo because of the fact that they don't speak English, you know? Well, all I know is this. Even if Canelo doesn't speak English, fans, boxing fans, will clamor for Canelo Triple G, especially, oh, yeah, if, we're, if, especially if we're talking about... There are two fights out there that boxing fans really want to see right now. Canelo and Triple G, yeah. Andre Waters and Sergey Kovalev. Now, Andre's talking about another interim fight before he fights Kovalev in November. The Kovalev fight in November is basically all done. I mean, both sides agree to everything, so that fight's going to come off. And, and I think those are the two biggest fights in boxing. Unless Floyd Mayweather turns around tomorrow and says he's coming out of retirement. But other than that, the two fights that the people want to see... Without doubt, is Gennady and Canelo, Sergey Kovalev, and Andre Wars. Do you really think, in all honesty, that anybody would care to see Mayweather Pacquiao too? Well, if Floyd were to come back for win number fifty, he's got a number of options. Number one is Pacquiao, like you say. I think people would care, but four million homes wouldn't buy the fight. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't have the popularity that it had the last time. You know, well, four million homes bought the fight at a hundred dollars a home or something like that. I think that Floyd's options right now with Danny Garcia, the winner of Keith Thurman, Sean Porter, certainly would become an option. You know, maybe Kel Brook. I mean, there are a number of guys out there that might lure Floyd Mayweather back. I mean, if he doesn't ask for crazy numbers, there's no question that either HBO or Showtime or whoever carries this fight. You know, could make some money. It's funny because the question was just asked on Twitter about a minute ago from one of our uh, listeners, Steve on Wrestler, who asked on Twitter, who will the winner of Thurman Porter face when they fight this summer? Mayweather's an option. Who are some of the other options? Well, I mean, there's a lot of good welterweights out there. They'll fight at 147 pounds, as I say. Certainly Danny Garcia, and we mentioned Kel Brook. I think those are the two best options. But, you know, your guy, Errol Spence, right there. He's right there. You know, he may need one or two more fights, but let's, let's face reality. He's a huge welterweight. He's a real big guy. He's got tremendous skills. He's got a tremendous punch. He can knock out anybody, and I think he's a future star. Wow. 
Well, I'll tell you, that would be good. The one thing we haven't really talked about during any of this conversation, the heavyweights. It seems like Mm -hmm. right now people are so wrapped up in Canelo, Triple G, we, you know, Mayweather still, Pacquiao, Thorman, Porter. I mean, those, those are the names in boxing, Harold. We don't really have any heavyweights right now to get excited about. Well, uh, Anthony Joshua is a heck of a puncher. We all know that. Yeah, what we don't know is, you know, is how good he can I mean, he needs experience. But in the 15 to 16 fights that he's had, what, one guy won seven rounds and everybody else he's knocked out in three rounds or less. I mean, he's shown that he can punch like a bloody blue mule. Uh, he's taken on the American Olympic fighter, Daniel Brazil, in his next defense. Uh, you know, certainly we ain't, you know, we meaning, meaning HBO, I mean, we're not out of the picture as far as Joshua is concerned. We're just waiting for a decent opponent because we know we're going to have to pay a lot of money for Anthony Joshua. So, you know, that's his reality. They probably going to turn on HBO or buy HBO pay-per-view to see, to see Anthony Joshua against the bum. We need Anthony Joshua against a good fighter, and that's what HBO is going to get into, into the picture without question. I think it's sometime in the fall. But without that, I mean, this is a guy that can crack. He, he's the second coming of Lennox Lewis. He's got a you know a great right hand and he's a big guy six foot five he punches like Lennox and the, all he needs is experience. You're going to be flying to Manchester in two months for the Tyson Fury Vladimir Klitschko rematch. Say that again. You're going to be going to uh, England right to watch Fury and Klitschko uh, the rematch in July. Yes, well you know it's not a done deal yet. We, we uh, HBO definitely has the Klitschko side. You know we'll, we've always done business with Klitschko. Uh, you know, Bernd Bonte and Shelly Finkel and that crap. But I understand that uh, Tyson Fury's people, meaning his promoter, Mick Hennessy, has been trying to shop the fight around. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what he's looking for another network or, or what the story is. But, you know, all I know is it's not exactly a done deal right now. I presume that we're going to get it done within the next few weeks. And uh, uh, hopefully it's in Manchester, England. We've been there many times before. And hopefully we'll go to Manchester, England, and televise the fight live. Who are the next big uh, HBO fights that's going to be on the calendar that you're aware of right now, Harold? Well, the, the biggest thing that we've got right now, interestingly enough, is a boxing after dark show on June the 4th. Uh, two Mexican guys that are just absolute killers. I mean, two of the most exciting guys in, in the entire sport. We've got Orlando Salido, you know. A tremendous fighter. He really is. Every time he steps into the ring, it's a war. Fighting for the 130-pound title that's held by Francisco Vargas, who in his last fight fought a, a, just a sensational fight with a, kid named, a Jack, Japanese kid named Takashi Miura. And uh, he, he knocked him out. I believe it was the 10th round. The eye was totally closed up. He had been knocked down in the fight. You know, uh, there, As a matter of fact, they had been knocking each other down, but uh, Vargas was behind in the fight, and he knocked out Miura to win the title. I mean, two absolutely sensational action guys. They're fighting at the StubHub Center, which in itself always puts on great fights. StubHub is an amazing place in Los Angeles, and uh, that's where the fight is. And, you know, it's a fight that the real diehard fight fans are looking forward to for the longest time. Vargas never fought uh, Salido. Salido never fought Vargas. They don't like each other. Two Mexican guys are going to kill each other, so... June the 4th, HBO Boxing After Dark. It's not pay-per-view. If you got HBO, you get it for free. And it's going to be sensational, I guarantee it. And then you've got Rocky Martinez against Vasyl Lomachenko the following week. Fight sucks. (laughs) 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 Number one, Bob Arum is a 14-carat jerk. I don't care what anybody says. It's the Hall of Fame weekend. He should never promote a fight on a Hall of Fame weekend. It's boxing after dark at the theater of Madison Square Garden. Uh, you know, that's, that's the weekend that, that uh, Ed Brophy has the huge uh, banquet. The night before the Hall of Fame inductions, he has a huge banquet in Canastota at the University of Syracuse. You know, Canastota, where the Hall of Fame is, is a 10-minute ride from, from uh, Syracuse University. And they normally get about 1,000 people to that dinner. And, you know, Ed Brophy, Ed Brophy at the Hall, Ed Brophy, by the way, is the executive director of the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And uh, he runs that big banquet on Saturday night where he gets all the Hall of Famers and the, the previous year's Hall of Famers and, you know, the inductees and everybody. And he makes a lot of money at the banquet because he needs the money to carry in the rest of the year, you know. 
I mean, you know, Ed's got to make a salary, too, and, and this is his big weekend. He has one weekend a year where people come from all over the world. And Aram goes out and he runs his show the same night as the Hall of Fame banquet, and I think it's a slap in the face to the inductees at the Hall of Fame and certainly a slap in the face to everybody, every previous boxing Hall of Fame. But football would never do a thing like that. When they hold their Hall of Fame inductions at Canton, Ohio, there's nothing else going on that day. Same thing with the baseball inductions in Cooperstown, New York. Well, you know, Aram comes along and he totally disregards the Hall of Fame induction, and he's holding a show that night, which is Vasily Lomachenko against the guy who shouldn't even be fighting. Orlando Salido crucified Rocky Martinez in his last fight, and, and everybody said they should have stopped the fight. It went to the scorecards, and Rocky Martinez got a draw and held on to his 130-pound title, which is what Lomachenko is going to fight him for, you know, uh, on June the 11th on the Hall of Fame weekend. And personally speaking, I, I, I know that Martinez is going to get knocked out because Salido beat him to death in Martinez's last fight. And as I say, he got a draw, but, you know, the guy shouldn't be fighting anymore. The semifinal is this Felix Verdejo, who I think three times in a row hasn't looked good on HBO. He's, uh, you know, supposed future Puerto Rican star. The Puerto Rican Day Parade is that weekend, and uh, everybody talks Felix Verdejo, Felix Verdejo, Felix Verdejo, but, you know, his last fight, I guess it was against Ivan Najera, went to distance, and Felix didn't look all that good. The kid is still undefeated, but he hasn't lived up to his star potential yet. So, you know... I, I'm very much against that, that show on uh, June the 11th. I'm sorry uh, if I'm insulting HBO or if I'm, uh, if I'm insulting Vasily Lomachenko, who, you know, is really a great fighter. He's a two-time Olympic gold medal winner. He's moving from 126 to 130, where I guess he can make, you know, a little bit more money. But, hey, a slap in the face is a slap in the face, and this to me is a slap in the face. That's all there is to it. You can follow Harold on Twitter at ShotFighter26. That is at ShotFighter26. And one thing I love about you, you never hide your true feelings, and that's one of the reasons why you've been with me so many years on this show and continue to do it again like you did today. And I can't thank you enough for giving up a good 25 minutes of your time and joining us on the program. It's great to be with you, Steve. Always love it. No Paso.